thank you for being here and sharing in the life and the celebration of the life of uh, Mrs. Jeanette Rush. We're blessed that you were here to share and be part of this and show your support and to show your love. For those of you that are seated, if you're able, would you like to stand for just a moment? I'm going to ask you to stand at the beginning and at the end, because we'll pray. I will pray now and I'll pray later. But other than that, you will be free to be seated. Lord, we are here to say farewell, to say goodbye, and yet to say thank you for a life that reflected you, declared your praises, taught, discipled, and encouraged. Lord, I thank you for the life of Jeanette Rush. I thank you, Lord, for her commitment, her tenacity, Lord, to stand for you no matter what and to share you to whomever would have ears to hear. I thank you. Lord, be here today. Be here in our hearts, in our midst, as we celebrate her life. And I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jeanette Louise Holmes Rush of Southington left for her promised heavenly home on September 5th, 2019. Born April 23rd, 1932 in Littleton, Maine, she was a daughter of Willis Aaron Holmes and Bertha Corey Holmes. A longtime resident of Southington, she retired from the Water Department in 1981. She was a teacher at the Full Gospel Christian School from 1982 to 1984 and was a working partner in Gifts in a Basket until it closed in 2015. Besides her parents, she was predeceased by her husband, James Rush, her sisters, Betty McKinnon and Carol Paxton, her brothers, Willis Jr. Holmes and Russell Holmes. She is survived by her daughter, Renee, and her husband, Brian Bellinger, and her son, Michael, with his wife, Judy LaFay, and their grandchildren, Brian, and his wife, Amy Bellinger, Richard Bellinger, Rachel, and her husband, Mark Simone, Lauren LaFay, Michelle, Michelle, and her husband, Evan O'Connor, and Belinda Brown, as well as her great-grandchildren, Kylie Rose and Kenzie Ray Simone. Charlie Rose Blanchett, Fallon Grace O'Connor, Jake, Katie, Carly Kubsek, and Giselle Brown. In lieu of flowers, donations can be made to Calvary Assembly of God, where she was an active member for many years. And we are here in this service to remember her today. If you are able to, in front of you, there is a red book like this, the hymnal one of her favorite hymns that she asked that we would sing at this service today, Rock of Ages.
her son Michael LaFay will come up and share. So, for it to be recorded, your every word you say is being recorded. <laughs> FBI on one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, thank you from the family for everybody that is here today. Um, it's humbling. Uh, I said this at my father's. Um, if you want to know what kind of job you do as a parent, uh, look at their friends. So thanks for that and this. Um, my sister should be the one up here, by the way. She's much better at this than I am. However, I've got the t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it a little bit easier. Um, yeah, she, mom wanted me to make a deal. She wanted me to sing during this. We had another deal. She was going to live till I retired, so I kept working. <laughs> um, she didn't keep that end, so I'm not singing. <laughs> um, at 87, there aren't a lot of people left around that can tell about Jeanette Holmes. Um, as a child, as a young woman, um, except Dale is here. He could probably have been up here telling that because um, he was around then. Uh, not many other people can say that. Um, so I thought that she deserved a little bit of recognition of, of that, of the Jeanette Holmes, um, that at five years old and six years old, her first job was picking kale and mustard off the potato plants. Uh, they were considered weeds. Um, when she was seven and eight, she was given her own section of potatoes to pick, um, which was a big deal. Uh, by the time she was nine, she was driving teams of horses and trucks in the potato fields uh, during the fall. Uh, if you can tell, being in Maine, in Aroostook County at least, um, potatoes are a big deal. Um, during high school, she worked at just about every retail store in the town of Holton while she was going to high school. She graduated from high school. She turned 17 in April, graduated in May, and then moved to Connecticut and started working um, as a secretary in Thomaston at 17 years old, um, living with her uncle, and, uh, but on her own and taking care of herself. And then uh, she decided she wanted to go to Zion Bible Institute in Rhode Island, um, which, again, women in college, different thing during her time, but she went. And she spent a year there and decided that missionary work wasn't what she wanted to do, so she left the school anyway. But she stayed in Rhode Island and um, worked at a bank there. And there she was known as according to all the pictures that I can find, she was Joe Holmes. Um, and, but she was making her own way, making her own life at a, at a, at a young age. And uh, she, didn't, she returned home to Littleton when her father was um, injured in a gravel pit collapse. And she went home to take care of him. And ended up marrying one of the local bad boys. Um, during that time, my father. <laughs> um, when she realized that that wasn't going to work out, um, by her account, out of the eight years they were married, uh, they were together for two. So um, 
when his five or six weeks trip to Alaska turned into 18 months, he came back to find out he was divorced. Um, and I mention that because she, it, it was a hard path at that time. People didn't get divorced back then. Um, they stayed together no matter what. Um, but she knew that it, it wasn't the right thing to do, so she went and made her own path again. Um, I was one of two children in my elementary school that, uh, whose parents were divorced in the entire school. Uh, that's how unusual it was back then. But she did it. And working three jobs, she took care of her family. Um, there was n uh, never a thought of welfare or um, any kind of assistance. It was all about you do what you need to do to take care of your family. That's um, something that was important to her. In our neighborhood, um, where we grew up, uh, her two brothers also moved into the same neighborhood. We had paths in the ground you could follow to each other's houses. Our kids were, that w as kids, we were interchangeable. It'd be like, yeah, I'm here, I'm staying here, I'm not. And she hosted all of our family events, birthday parties, anything. Um, we were where they came to make ice cream uh, when everybody came. That was one of the things that you could count on happening there. Any social event, it took place at our house. Um, and during the summers, as a single mom, she would send me to Maine to stay with my grandparents, to stay with my aunt, because she wanted me to have connection to family. Um, it was important to her. She was tough. She was very tough, sometimes too tough. Uh, she would put off going to the doctor until the very last minute, always. Um, right around 1981, I was uh, with her in the doctor's office while she's in agony. Um, and a disc ruptured while she was there and she ended up having to have emergency surgery. And that was pretty much the, the point at which, a, like a long spiral into poor health started taking place. Um, because of that, it, it led to more issues that she wasn't able to do anything about. Um, so this beautiful, vibrant, independent, and adventurous woman was forced to give up many of the things that she saw as things that made her who she was. Um, and she dealt with that for a long time. So that's why I wanted to talk about just the person that did that as a, as a young person. Um, and set the example um, that I hope that I've followed and <clears throat> that my family I hope follows. That family's important, you take care of yourself and uh, you do what you need to do. Oh yeah, did I mention? <laughs> Mom liked me best. <laughs> I'll take the microphone. Thank you. In addition to her son, one of her grandsons is going to come and share Richard Bellinger. Are you the mic up? Yes. All right. Everything you say. Got you. All right, first off, thank you guys for coming. Our family is greatly appreciative of all of you. Um, it was the week of Memorial Day this past year. My grandfather had just passed away, and my mom had been spending a lot of time with my other grandmother. And I get a text message, and it says, your grandmother wants you to do the eulogy at her funeral and wants your uncle to sing a song. I thought this was the weirdest thing because why would my meme ever want my uncle to sing a song. 
Then I realized it was my other grandmother. And I was gonna put my uncle on the spot for all of you to hear his beautiful voice that my grandmother loved, but he beat me to the punch on this, and I guess he had a different, a different uh, deal with her than I did, so I'm stuck up here doing this. But, it, you know, <laughs> thinking about doing somebody's eulogy while they're still living is a weird concept, but it got me to thinking. And why would she ever want me to do this? Why not my uncle who could pretty much convince her to do anything? He had the magic touch, whatever it was, he could tell her to do it, except go to the doctor's office. But why wouldn't she want him to do it? Or my mom, who is the spitting image of my grandmother and exactly alike, like her, but in all the good ways, mom. <laughs> or my brother, who has done this a couple times now. He can get up here and he can remember bits and pieces from when we were growing up. His memory is like no other. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but he can get up here and he can remember that day in 1988 when we were doing something in Maine. So why not him? My cousins, she told me right off the bat why it wasn't you. She just was gonna smack you guys. So there was, there was no, no reason for you to, to do this. So I realized, well, maybe she's playing a cruel joke on me. Um, she always wanted me to be a preacher, so she, I'm behind the pulpit now, I mean. And you're being recorded and, and you're, you're videotaped. And, and lightning didn't strike, so I think I'm good. But I, I knew I was good when all you bikers walked in and lightning didn't strike you guys, so I was, I was pretty good. But then I really realized why she wanted me up here. It's because I'm her favorite, obviously. You may have the t-shirt, but I'm her favorite. See, I had this uncanny ability to I could do no wrong in her eyes. Whatever it was, didn't matter. Until I left the house and somebody else came over and she told them everything I did wrong. So, but still, I'm her favorite. But it got me to thinking, like I said, trying to think of somebody's eulogy while they're still living is, is a very weird concept. So I wanted to do something a little bit that tailed to her. And many of you may not know this, but one of her biggest hobbies was reading. Uh, for the longest time, that's all, I mean, every day she would read a book. She could finish a book in a day or two. It's one of the things that my uncle and my mom actually had in common with her the most. For as long as I can remember, they would always buy books. They would trade them between the three of them. There would be a book on the table for my uncle to walk in and grab. He would drop off books. Um, so. It's one of the things that just sticks out the most with me. So we're gonna, I wanted to put her life as a book. Now, the prologue has been written for a couple years now, and the chapter's pretty much cemented in stone, but we needed to put the final period on her book because the publisher decided it was time for her to, for the book to be put into print. Now, the thing is, everybody in here today is a part of her book. Some of you may only have a sentence or two. Some of us have full chapters. We're spread throughout the book. Um, the pastor, I read the chapter on you. I'm gonna ask the publisher for a rewrite. It says, it's a doozy. But, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for that one. But, like I said, we're here to put the final period on her book. And the the greatest part about it, though, is that she gets to start a new book while we're all continuing ours. And her book now is going to be up in heaven with my grandfather, and they get to start an eternity together and finish out, or start another book while we keep going on with ours. So I'm... Um, I'm very happy that my grandmother now gets to enjoy that aspect of her life because truth be told, I actually wasn't her favorite. It was my grandfather. So now she's back with him and he gets to stare into her blue eyes again and enjoy her for the rest of his life.
Jeanette wanted to leave space in this service for any others in their family or friends who maybe had something they wanted to share. This would be the moment where you would like to, you could share something of a memory of Jeanette. Yeah, I don't know what all this talk about you being the favorite and you being the favorite is because you know how my grandmother felt about lying in church, so. Um, I just briefly wanted to say what the most important thing that my grandmother ever did for me, and that was pray for me. So for our family, you know, throughout the years that we had people to look up to, like Aunt Betty, and Uncle Junior, and my grandmother. And whenever anything was wrong, or anyone had a problem, or anyone needed prayer in their life, they would look to those people. And my grandmother was the last, last of them, and the last in a great family. And we don't have them to go to anymore. So it's up to those that are left to take the mantle of what my grandmother did and what my great aunts and uncle did. It's up to my mom and my cousins and my uncle and me to pray for our families because as a parent it's the most important thing that you can do for your children is to pray for them and to be there for them when they need you so I could go like my brother said I can remember things from way back when, and I could go on and on and on about them. But I just wanted to say that the most important thing that my grandmother ever did for me, and for everyone in here, was pray for them. Jeanette, in the last few, especially, I would say, Renee, especially in the last few months, really looked forward um, to going home, to really going to be with the Lord. She grew up on the promise of heaven, the hope of heaven, next to believing and loving Jesus, believing him and loving Jesus was I've got a mansion over the hilltop. I've got a home that's waiting for me. I can't wait to be there when God calls me home.
see the pictures and I had said to somebody just prior to this service I can tell immediately where they are because it was a rustic county it is very easy to identify a rustic county I listened to what Mike is sharing about his mom what Richard is sharing what BJ or Brian James is sharing and and I, I hear your story, Michael, and I hear how you saw your mom growing up as a child in that home. And I just, I, I hear it and I said, I feel like there's so much crossover with the philosophy of life that your mom had and the philosophy of life that my mother had. I'm, I'm hearing you and saying, wow, I feel, like, I feel like you could have grown up in my home, I could have grown up in your home. And I thought, well, of course, Rooster County, they, they breed really powerful, strong people who really learn to rely on God or go into a deep, deep hole, <laughs> but mostly to rely on God. Jeanette Rush has a part, been a part of this church probably going back to the mid to late 50s. She was a part of this church when my uncle was a pastor in 1959. She loved this church. She always sought to support this church. I was so appreciative when she came after I had become pastor. She had moved back up here just before that. And right after I became pastor, she and Jim began attending this church. Renee and her boys began attending this church. It took Brian another year or two, but we got them. <laughs> um, and they have been here ever since. Anything that we ever wanted to try to do to accomplish something in this church, um, Jeanette was right there. She spearheaded so many of those um, chilly nights, chilly week in, in October, and the apple shortcakes. And the, the first year she was here, um, spearheaded a, per, a float for the parade. First time that this church had been in a, in a parade for the Apple Festival. Not the first float for her, but the first one for us. And, and the only one, I believe, that we had done. And we took first prize, I believe, for that, for that float. The hard work that she worked on that tirelessly with everybody. And she didn't let any of you off the hook, did she, Linda? <laughs> yeah, all, of, all of you, the nephews, the nieces, the, you were, if you were here, if you were anywhere in Connecticut, you were on that float working, making paper flowers for weeks and weeks and weeks. But the reward was incredible, just to see family working together, to see a church represented in the community, and to see the, the, the light of Christ being able to be reflected on that float and that day, and then to take home a prize, to just be honored for that. She is being honored in heaven for all the hard work that she has done, all the glory that she sought to give to God through her life. There were, there were two verses of scripture that she would quote, one more than the other. There was one that we had going when she, that we kind of teased each other with when she served as treasurer. When, when she was a treasurer for this church, she also had to do all the bookkeeping and she, it was everything. 
And um, I would come in on a Monday morning and she would be here bright and early in the office or sometimes I'd beat her if I could get her at 6 a.m. Um, and she would come in. If I was here and she would come in, now understand, I have an office in the back corner of the building and it faces east. And so when I'm here in the morning, there's a lot of light coming in those windows. I have two windows. The office she would work in is in the middle and there's one little window facing north. So there's not much light in the office that she's working in, but there's a lot in mine. And she would walk in, and I would hear her come in, and she would come to the door and she'd say, men love darkness better than light. Because I wouldn't have any lights on, because I'm in a room with two large windows, and it is bright in my office. And I would smile about that, and one day she came in, and it's, it's one of these things we're teasing each other, and one day she came in and she said, men love darkness rather than light. And I said, yes, but I would rather be by the light of God than the light of men. And that was the last time we teased each other. Because <laughs> finally, I had to come back. <laughs> finally, I could answer. Um, but it was, it was fun. We, there was no question that she, she loved me, and she, she respected me as a pastor, and I had nothing but love and respect for her. Her other verse... It's from Psalm 46, verse 10, and I'm going to read the whole psalm. But the verse that she would quote so often, and if I've heard it as often as I have, you and the family have heard this verse as well. Be still and know that I am God. Now, I, I heard her say that and use that for several different reasons. I would say all appropriate but I, I want to look at this psalm and, and apply it to her life. The psalm reads like this, and you have to get the whole psalm to appreciate how I'm applying this to Jeanette Rush. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fail. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is a, a psalm of a psalmist who sought to write something that was put to music, designed to bring courage to a nation who knew all too well what war could bring who knew all too well how, how nations get defeated, and they were on the brink of being defeated. And yet the psalmist brought a song that said to the people, that said to the king, you be of courage because you serve a God who's bigger than all of your enemies. You serve a God who is bigger than all those who oppose you. The God you serve is more powerful than anyone who would dare come against you. No matter what, you serve a God whose wars has a means to an end. When God, when God brings down the strongholds, then there will be peace. When God strikes, war is over. And in that context, this psalmist says to the king and to all those living in Jerusalem, therefore you be still and know who God is. Your world shakes and quakes. Your world is in an upheaval inside out, upside down. But you, you be still and know that I am God. Jeanette had a life that had 
chapters of difficulty throughout her adult life, probably beyond that. After all, as we heard, she is of the county. She's in Aroostook. My parents grew up, they were born and raised in Aroostook. I know what people went through and what they endured in through the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s in Aroostook. There's a reason why more than half of Aroostook County by the end of the 50s had migrated down to southern New England. Life was hard up there. And yet they can look back and say, life was good up there. My mom was one of those who couldn't wait after retirement to move back to the county she moved away from. Because while there was a difficulty in living, there was something about the county that just drew them back. Jeanette, she knew difficulty, but she knew God. She faced challenges, but she knew God. She could be stubborn with her health issues, but she knew God. She may not have wanted to go to a doctor to be treated, but she was always willing to go to God for healing and for searching and for answers and for direction for her life. When she often would say, be still and know that I am God, it was usually in the reference of, there's not a lot you can do about the, the circumstances of your life, so be quiet before the Lord and let the Lord direct your life. Do I have that about right? So often you and I can walk through life in our, and our lives are such chaos. There's such stress, there's such strain, there's such anxiety that just flows through our veins. The psalmist here is telling a whole nation in the midst of that kind and that level of burden and anxiety and worry and care must be met with a knowledge, a stillness, a realization that God is bigger then all of those cares and all of those worries and all of those troubles and all that anxiety that may exist in your life, God is greater. Jeanette, if she could stand here and she had this opportunity to look at all of you at once and she, and she was asked to speak on, on her favorite verse, she would look at you and say, you need to trust in God. Don't trust in man because man will fail you. Trust in God, he will never fail you. She went to her last days trusting in God, looking to Him. When I would visit her over the last couple years of visiting her, and on a Saturday, she would be watching her favorite preacher on TV. And we would sit and she would just talk about heaven. She couldn't wait. For heaven. I've sat with people in conditions such as Jeanette Rush's, who could spend all of their time talking about the pains of their life and the woes of their life and woe is me, why me? And, and maybe she did at times. Maybe she did have moments when she said, I'm so sick of this pain. But most of the time, her conversation was centered around, I can't wait to get to heaven. My home is in heaven. I don't have much longer here. That's why we, my wife and I chose the song that I sang. You re listen to those verses. You realize that your flesh is, is but a moment. Your flesh is, is like a, a, literally like a cage holding you back until Jesus says, come home. And I love that phrase that says that your, your, your clay, the body, just literally opens up and there you are released and you are free. The day that she passed away, that day her spirit literally came right out and said, I'm free. The family sees what remains and then there's the grief and the hurt and the pain of, of letting go and, and seeing someone pass. But that, that spirit just went and is gone. To be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. She was released. She longed for that day. And on this day, on September 5th, 
she was freed. On September the 5th, she was freed. She could be freed and longed for in those days because of her hope, because she dared. She had the tenacity to stand for Jesus Christ. If she could instill on, on you her family, she would instill that on you. Hold to Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Why? Because he's the one who needs to direct your path. Look to Jesus. Everything else is sinking sand. Everything else are things made of man, made of clay that will crumble and fall and be no more. The Bible says that in the last day, everything on this planet, everything we know as earth will be no more, but the only the things of God will continue. So what do we cling to and what do we hold on to? Something that cannot survive or we hold on to something that is eternal? I am holding on to eternity. Jeanette Rush held on to eternity. She would want you as her family cling to eternity. That translates cling to Jesus. Cling to Jesus. There is no other direction. There is no other answer. Cling to Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. You cannot come to him. You cannot come to God by any other means. There is no other way, Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, would you help us? Would you help the family, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Be with them, Lord, through this day, through this week, through the weeks and months that follow. Because, Lord, while, Je while Jeanette is free, while she is resting and enjoying the very presence of God, those of us that are left behind still feel the loss of that separation. We still feel the loss of a life that is no longer with us. But help us, Lord, to see not in our own eyes, but in your eyes, there was time for Jeanette to go home. There was time for her to leave this place, to leave the jar of clay and spend eternity with you. Help us, Lord, as a family. to hold on to what is eternal and not to what is of flesh. That through our grief, we remember our hope. Lord, eternity is our hope. Jesus Christ, he is our hope. Help us, Lord, to hold on to our hope. In Christ's name. There's one more hymn that we wanted to do because we closed this service and it's found on page 206 in the little red book in front of you.
all stand. At the close of this service, you are invited to join the family downstairs where a lunch has been prepared. Um, as we close, I'm also going to give thanks. So, Lord, I thank you for this time that we have been together. It is not over. It is not ending. Jeanette has a new chapter of eternity for her. For those of us that knew her, we have memories that will continue on. I thank you, Lord, for her life. I thank you, Lord, for her commitment to you. For her willingness, Lord, to serve you, whatever capacity you made available. She saw a door open and she walked through it. And she stayed as long as you told her that she needed to be there. And she served you faithfully. I thank you, Lord, for her life. I ask you, Lord, to minister peace to every family member, every friend who feels the loss of Jeanette in their life today. That they would sense your stillness in their heart and their soul. That they would not have to be filled with trouble and worry and anxiety. That their grief would not overtake them. But that even even then, even in that moment, that psalm would come back. Be still and know that I am God. That we would let you, O oh God, quiet our hearts, quiet our spirit, to rest in you, even as we walk through the uncertainties of this life, to know you are there. And Lord, as we leave this sanctuary and we go downstairs for lunch that has been prepared, I thank you, Lord, for the generosity of the family providing a luncheon for their, their family and their friends. Lord, bless it, I pray. We are thankful and we are a grateful people. In Christ's name. Thank you so much. Mama.